So I count, I count. <laughs> Diana's out of here. Sorry about that. I counted eight. Eight? Yeah. Okay. You sure? So she's pretty tight. That's pretty tight. Good morning. The time is 12 o'clock p.m. I call to order the April 17, 2024 meeting of the Contractor State License Board. I'm Diana Love, CSLB's board chair. I want to first welcome our newest board member, Henry Nutt III, welcome, of American Canyon. Henry was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom in February 2024. He has served as a pre-construction executive for Southland Industries since 2019 and a sheet metal general superintendent for Southland Industries since 2007. Henry serves as one of two specialty contractors on our board. Henry, would you like to say a few words? Oh, thank you for having me. I look forward to working with everyone and very excited about the opportunity. 
Thank you and welcome. We have a unique setup today as we will be conducting a strategic plan session to develop a three-year strategic plan. Board members and CSOB staff are situated at separate tables to facilitate the discussion. Cameras and microphones in the room will pick up our discussions. This meeting will be live streamed pursuant to Business and Professions Code 7006. And today, Rodney Kobos has an excused absence. Robin, would you please call the roll? Present. Thank you, Robin. Before we begin, Vice Chair Michael Mark, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Today, certain CSLB management and executive staff are here to participate in the strategic plan session. Tricia St. Clair with the Department of Consumer Affairs, Solid Planning Solutions is here with her staff to, condu to conduct the strategic plan. Before we begin our strategic plan session, we need to turn to agenda item B for public comments. On agenda item B, which is for public comments and requests for items, agenda items for future meetings, the board values public input as part of our consumer protection mission. To allow us enough time to conduct our full schedule of business today, I'm limiting public comments to three minutes apiece. If your comments don't involve an item on today's agenda, this would be the time where you can make them. If you have comments on one of our agenda items, we encourage you to wait until we get to that item. We'll give you an opportunity to make your comments at that time. We have a few other rules that apply. First, California law prohibits board members from discussing any matter brought up during public comment. Also, we are not allowed to act on any item not on today's agenda. Second, if you want the board to discuss a topic not on the agenda, you can ask us to consider placing that item on the agenda for a future meeting. And finally, if you have an application, complaint, or disciplinary charges pending before the board, we ask that you do not discuss the details of your case or pending complaint. And that is because board members may be the judges and by law are not permitted to receive evidence or information that is not part of the administrative record in the case. At this time, are there any members of the public who wish to address the board or offer possible agenda items for future meetings? Seeing none, do any board members have an item they would like to place on the agenda for future meetings? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to item C, which is strategic planning session. There are seven items on the agenda for discussion. I want to alert our viewers and any members of the public present that the meeting going forward will be interactive. We will ask for public comment after each of the seven items. The public is welcome to follow along. And I'm going to ask John to make a um, clarification about audio. The uh, 
when the group here separates into smaller groups, there's going to be a lot of discussion that's going to be overlapping. You won't be able to be picked up by the audio here. So the audio most likely will be shut down during the small group session and then reopened for public comment after the each item. Thank you, John. With that, I will turn it over to Tricia St. Clair with DCA. The floor is yours, Tricia. Thank you. I'm guessing I need to be by microphone. Uh, all right. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to the uh, Contractor State License Board Strategic Planning Session. Uh, my name is Tricia St. Clair. I'm a strategic business analyst and facilitator with Solid Planning, and I'm here with... Hi, I'm Sari Rani. I'm also a strategic uh, business analyst and facilitator with Solid. Uh, so we are a neutral party. We don't represent DCA. We don't represent the licensees. We simply are here to provide structure to the process. Part of that structure is uh, we will be typing the brainstorming session today. But what you're creating today is a draft. So don't worry if you see spelling errors or grammar errors. Uh, we'll clean that up later. Uh, we're here till 5, or maybe if we um, work really hard, we'll get out earlier than that. But uh, because of that limited time frame, uh, we hope that you can uh, reduce distractions and mainly just silence your cell phones. We hope uh, this is a brainstorming session, so we hope all contributions are respected and that people feel comfortable participating. And if it comes to making a decision, ask yourself if you can live with it uh, as we try to reach consensus. So the agenda is we will start out by watching a diversity, equity, and inclusion video. You'll hear us uh, referring to that as DEI because it's such a mouthful. We have two videos for you to watch. Together, they, are, they will be about 20 minutes. After that, we'll briefly review the strategic planning process. Uh, we'll review CSLB's environmental scan, and then uh, we'll get to the heart of today, which is brainstorming objectives for your new strategic plan. Uh, so we'll start with these videos. Again, there are two of them. Together, they'll total about 20 minutes. And um, I'll let Sarah do the honors for starting them. Hi. My name is Lisa Bacon, Training Manager with the Department of Consumer Affairs Solid Training and Planning Solutions Team. I'm excited to bring today's training video about diversity, equity, and inclusion, also known as DEI, to all of you. My training experience in DEI goes back to 2015 across multiple departments, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to support DCA's DEI efforts. What does DEI mean? That's the title of today's training video and is truly reflective of what we will cover. The training content was collaboratively built using resources, research, and training with the goal to further our understanding of this important topic. <coughs> this training video will provide a foundation of the general concepts, understanding, and importance of DEI. The SOLID team is honored and excited to be a part of DCA's DEI initiatives, and we will continue to expand our commitment to DEI through both training and learning. I'm also proud to share this year, every SOLID trainer will be DEI certified and more DEI trainings are on the horizon. I expect this will only be the beginning of exciting things to come for DCA. So now, Let's get into it. What does DEI mean? Our learning objectives for this training will be to understand what diversity means and who it relates to, why it's necessary to choose equity versus equality. We'll discuss the benefits reflected in our work culture when we practice inclusion, and I'll share several examples of how to integrate DEI. I think it's important to mention this training's alignment with our mission statement, which is to advance a diverse, equitable, and inclusive California Department of Consumer Affairs for all. To understand diversity, we first need to define what it means. Diversity is all the characteristics and experiences which define each of us as individuals and the groups to which we belong. Often there's a mindset which associates diversity with only individuals who fall under the protected classes. 
Diversity is relevant and inclusive of every human being based on each aspect of our lives. We are multidimensional beings, which makes us diversely unique. Race and ethnicity are frequently misunderstood. People don't always recognize or identify themselves with one simplistic and usually limited category listed on a demographic questionnaire. To shed some light on this, here are the definitions. Race is biological and refers to groups of people often based on physical characteristics such as the color of their skin. Ethnicity is a broader term than race and it's your cultural identity. It's chosen or learned from your culture and family experiences, such as a certain custom, traditions, and languages you've been exposed to within the group you feel you belong. Someone might say their race is black, yet they associate their ethnicity with Portuguese. Or another person might say their race is white and their ethnicity is Irish. I'm a fan of this diversity iceberg because I feel it's a good representation of human diversity. Above the waterline, we can only see about 20 to 30 percent of an iceberg. The other 70 to 80 percent is below the surface. When we first interact with someone, there are features we can quickly identify in a short amount of time, such as their body language, an accent when they speak, possibly their gender, and how they're dressed. But these only represent very limited and sometimes inaccurate characteristics of the person. There are numerous layers and dimensions to who we really are, such as our education, sexual orientation, work ethic, strengths, life experiences, and personality traits. And it's impossible to identify these core attributes within a person until we've invested the time to find out. And this is when unconscious bias comes into play, above the surface, when our brains quickly respond to a person or group of people simply based on limited external perceptions. Our brain is biologically wired to rapidly intake information all around us to determine our safety. It's the mechanism which activates our fight or flight response. This is also known as implicit bias. It's an unconscious response and inherent to all humans. We're exposed to influences from an early age based on our environment. Our family, education from schools, community, television, movies, marketing, and one of the most powerful influences in our culture today is social media. Because of these unconscious influences, our brains begin to form stereotypes about the society around us. People who look or act a certain way are categorized in our minds based on these mental intakes. Have you ever had that gut feeling when you've been around someone for five seconds? It's important to listen to our intuition, but this becomes a problem when we have a strong reaction to someone based on very limited information. We want to trust that feeling and sometimes revere it as a superpower, but we need to make sure we pause and ask ourselves truthfully what prompted those feelings. This is why unconscious bias tends to have a negative connotation. It is how our brains work, but we have to hold ourselves accountable for how we respond, especially when it's based on an unfair judgment. If we're brave enough to ask and listen to how we've impacted the people around us, we can become more aware of our own biases and reprogram our brain's response system. Viktor Frankl says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Now I want to talk about the E in DEI and the difference between equality versus equity. Equality happens when we provide the same equal treatment to everyone and it can feel fair. When we choose to give equity, we create pathways to equal outcomes by recognizing that some people and communities have unequal starting points. This picture reflects what it looks like when we give everyone equal resources. Our intentions may be good, but when we check in and ask people how they're doing, we'll find out not everyone was able to participate. If we check in with people first and find out what they need, it levels the playing field for everyone to succeed. Equality is often related to what most of us know as the golden rule. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. 
But what you need to succeed can look very different from the people around you. Equity is a verb and a choice. We should all practice the platinum equity rule, which is ask people what they need, then choose to give it so they feel respected. We all deserve respect. Aretha Franklin sang it best. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. She says, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And this is when inclusion comes in. Inclusion is the practice it takes to create a positive work environment where the differences of every team member is recognized, understood, and valued. Inclusion is about building trust within our working relationships. One attempt isn't going to automatically change everything, and it's not always easy because we don't automatically know what everyone needs or how people prefer to engage. Inclusion takes time and practice. The key is we need to be curious, ask, listen, and invite the people you serve to provide input. Don't just ask for their feedback after the project is said and done. Give everyone involved a voice and a seat at the table. When we practice inclusion, it lifts morale. Retention increases because people like coming to work. When people feel valued and heard, they're innovative, which inspires collaboration within teams, and DCA becomes a destination employer. Simon Sinek believes the role of a leader is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of a leader is to create an environment in which great ideas can happen. How can we create inclusive engagement? Hold meetings regularly, then give people options for how to communicate and provide input. In work groups, extroverts tend to speak up and sometimes dominate conversations. If an introvert or analytical person who needs a little more time to problem solve isn't given an opportunity, great ideas and insight can be lost. Groupthink, also known as conformity bias, can quickly contaminate a group when everyone's voice isn't heard and understood. When a special assignment or project is given, make sure the goals and expectations are clear. Give everyone on the team an opportunity to learn and grow from a special assignment. Create a mentoring opportunity by pairing someone more experienced with someone who's new to the project. This knowledge transfer is ideal for succession planning. There is a DEI section in the Strategic Planning Environmental Scan. It will centralize input on DEI matters and contains demographic information collected. This section can help further inform the board as it considers impacts of policy decision. Our mission is to provide outstanding support services, oversight, and innovative solutions to boards and bureaus that regulate California professionals and vocations so that through this partnership, all Californians are informed, empowered, and protected. Our vision, together protecting California consumers. Our values, accountability, communication, diversity, employees, integrity, leadership, service, and transparency. As a board, you should ensure that your mission, vision, and values supports change and evolves to meet the needs of all Californians. We want all Californians to feel accepted in seeking services we provide. As board members, you are the leaders of the industry you regulate. In this next section, we will discuss actionable areas to incorporate DEI in four areas, policy, licensing, enforcement, and outreach. In policy, we need to ask ourselves if the decisions we are considering will lead to the success of everyone involved. Reflect on who will benefit from or be burdened by the proposal or decision being considered. Are the needs of one demographic different from another geographic group? Think equity. What data or metrics will you use to evaluate the impacts of your decisions? Leverage methods that increase public input and engagement, such as workshops, surveys, and multilingual communications. Actively engage with diverse and underserved communities. Reach out to associations, colleges, interested parties, other licensing or regulatory bodies. 
Utilize the strategic planning process. Review information collected through the new environmental scans, which incorporate DEI questions. In licensing, when licensees reflect communities they serve, it expands access to all. Use plain language. Simplify communication so it's easy to understand and complete. Expand multilingual resources for applicants and consumers. Consider additional pathways to gain experience and or education for licensure. Expand outreach for subject matter experts to ensure the exam development process is inclusive. When it comes to enforcement, drive fair outcomes and protect the vulnerable. Review enforcement data and trends. Update enforcement policies, processes, and procedures to mitigate unintended consequences to impacted populations through increased engagement with consumers, stakeholders, and communities. When you build your team, consider the needs of all the communities we serve. Do you need more bilingual staff? Do you need additional staff in certain areas of the state? Expand your outreach through HR, job fairs, and inquire about other opportunities you may not have considered before. As you begin to integrate DEI, remember you can't take the bias from the person, but you can remove the bias from the process. Through outreach, you can increase access and opportunity when you reach and meet people where they're at. Do you know what the second most common language in California is? Spanish. So. When you translate resource materials based on the people you serve, you expand language access. Develop multilingual communications for social media posts, applications, forms, and other resources you provide. Publish written and video testimonials from your diverse consumers, which reflect their age, race, gender, and cultural differences. As you begin to integrate DEI, remember to leverage all the resources available to you at DCA. The Equal Employment Opportunity Office administers the American Sign Language and Real-Time Captioning Services contract. The EEO Office conducts the department-wide language survey to identify the public it serves, the languages spoken, and the bilingual resources available at DCA to ensure equal access is provided for all consumers. The Consumer Information Center administers a contract that provides phone language services to consumers in over 200 languages. The Office of Human Resources administers the Bilingual Pay Program, including the establishment of bilingual positions. The Office of Publications, Design, and Editing coordinates requests for the translation of written materials. The Solid Training and Planning Solutions offers DEI-related trainings, surveys, meeting facilitation, and development of strategic plans. The Office of Professional Examination Services offers examination translation, and adaptation services. I want to share one of the many examples of how the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology has integrated DEI. The California Board of Barbering and Cosmetology celebrates the ever-changing diversity of California's consumers and licensees. So we can establish a quorum. Which is why the board has made a concerted effort to expand on its language accessibility. Here are some of our achievements. Upon request, each individual that visits the board in person is given the opportunity to access an interpreter via the language line phone service if the individual does not feel they are able to effectively communicate with board staff. Let's take a look. Good morning, how can I help you? Uh, okay, is there another language that you prefer? Do you see one on this list? A unit within the Department of Consumer Affairs called the Consumer Information Center, or CIC, provides phone agents who assist consumers and licensees in English, Spanish, and more than 240 other languages with the assistance of a third-party vendor via the toll-free number 1-800-952-5210. Phone agents usually serve as the public's first point of contact. They provide many services to both consumers and licensees. CIC phone agents answer nearly one million calls per year. The board provides three additional language access pages in Spanish, Vietnamese, 
and Korean languages on its website, www.barbercosmo.ca.gov. The English homepage has the option for Google Translate. Almost every publication, form, bulletin, and trifold the board provides is translated into Spanish, Vietnamese, and Korean. Items such as the self-inspection worksheet and the what to expect when you're inspected trifold are available in these languages. Select videos such as foot spa cleaning and disinfecting have been translated into the Vietnamese language and posted to the board's website. Hi, my name is Kai with the State Board and I'm here doing inspection. When inspecting salons with Vietnamese speaking individuals where violations have been found, inspectors utilize a translated violation cover sheet which contains a simplified translated explanation of select common violations. Citations that are issued to nail salons are provided in both the English and Vietnamese languages to the establishment owner. Board inspectors, exam site staff, and headquarters staff receive updated specialized training on how to utilize an interpreter via the language line phone service to address language access situations found in their respective job roles. Interpreters are provided free of charge to petitioners in disciplinary review hearings upon request so that each licensee can fully understand their hearing and the additional information provided at the hearing. The California Board of Barbering and Cosmetology is dedicated to providing all individuals with meaningful access to the board's services, programs, and activities. We are working hard to expand our language access and will continue to do so. When we think about DEI, remember diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, Inclusion is an action, and the outcome is belonging. UC Berkeley's Others and Belonging Institute states, Belonging describes values and practices where no person is left out of the circle of concern. Belonging means more than having just access. It means having a meaningful voice and the opportunity to participate. We need to make sure our efforts aren't just transactional. They need to be transformative and it will take time. So remember, DEI is a journey, not a destination. All right, and we have one more video, it's shorter. In 2022, Governor Newsom issued an executive order directing state agencies and departments to build upon the state's efforts to advance equity by taking new concrete actions to address disparities and expand opportunity for all Californians. The governor's executive order builds upon and strengthens the state's commitment to a California for all. We all have an important role in this effort. As you develop your board's strategic plan, building in and embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion into the goals and objectives is one of the most effective ways we can make progress and produce results with long-lasting impacts. The work that the boards and bureaus do touches the lives of every Californian. That is why it is so important to take into account every Californian when building out the board's mission, vision, values, and goals. The department's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Steering Committee and the SOLID team are available as a resource to help you in meeting those goals. Thank you for being a part of making our department a diverse, equitable, and inclusive California Department of Consumer Affairs for all. So um, after we've seen that video, I'm going to wake you up by having you play a quick game. And by quick, I mean 30 seconds. It's going to go really fast. And my apologies to one of the tables in the back because I, um, for some reason, thought there would be 20 here and I didn't bring enough forms. But for the table in the back that doesn't have the form of which I'll be speaking, you can look at the screen and um, visually find the numbers. So you should have a piece of paper that looks like this, with the exception of the one table that has just one, apologies. 
And when I say go, um, don't go yet, but when I say go, I'm going to want you to count um, by touch. So you can use a finger, you can use um, the cap of your pen, but you're literally going to find the number one by touch, and then you're going to find the number two, and then the number three, until I say to stop. Um, does that make sense? Okay, I'll repeat it, because someone said they didn't hear it. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to play a game, with, and when I say go, what I'd like you to do is use a piece of paper that looks like this, and I want you to, by touch, count. So you'll use your finger or a pen, and you'll find the number one, and then you'll go to the number two, and then three, until I say to stop. Does that make sense, what we're going to do? Okay. I have a, um... Oh, Sarah's going to time. Okay, that's even better. You get 30 seconds. Yes, you have 30 seconds, and go. So did anyone get as high as 10? Okay, very good. Anyone get as high as 15? Okay, what was the highest you got to? 15. 15, okay. Anyone get beyond 15? 15. Okay, all right. So actually, there is a strategy to this game. And the strategy is that if you place a grid over that piece of paper, um, we'll keep this up for the next round, the number one is in the first quadrant, the number two in the second, the number three. And when you get to nine, you go over, up to the top for 10, and then you just keep following the numbers for the direction wow. to follow each subsequent number. Yeah. So when I say go, um, now you have a, a, a map, a plan. Um, does the grid make sense to people what's happening? OK. All right. Did people do better this time? Yeah. Okay. Um, did people, um, anyone get up to 30? How about 45? Okay. What was the highest number someone got to? 35? 54. Okay. Wow. Excellent. All right. So the, the point of that exercise, <laughs> the point of that exercise is that when you have a plan, when you have a strategy, you're much more effective with your time and resources. And so that's what a strategic plan is. It's a guide for your um, board to use its time and resources in the most effective way possible to reach its goals. So if you've ever looked at a directory, let's say you've gone to a mall or you're at a business and you're looking at a directory, what's the first thing, the most important thing to find first? Where you are, yes. Where you are, because where you are determines how you get to where you're going. If I'm going to LA, it's going to be a lot different if I'm starting from Sacramento than if I'm starting from San Diego. So with strategic planning, we always start with where you are. And where you are now is um, identified by your mission statement, why you exist, your values, and then your environmental scan. And when we say environmental scan, the environment we're talking about is the CSLB workplace what's going on, what's going well there, what could be improved, and then the outside world, because we don't want to be in a bubble. There could be something in the outside world that CSLB would like to take advantage of that's either happening now or coming in the future or might need to prepare for. And then your destination, where you're going, 
is your vision statement. If you achieve your mission, um, you, or excuse me, if you, um, yes, if you achieve your mission statement, you get to your vision. And then goals represent CSLB's day-to-day -day activities, such as licensing and testing and enforcement. Objectives are shorter term. They last the length of your strategic plan, which is usually two to five years in length. And objectives are what you'll be creating today. And then after today, um, this is at a, a separate time, um, there'll be an action plan, which is where uh, we meet with board staff, we look at the strategic plan and the objectives and break those objectives down into goals, or excuse me, tasks that are assigned to staff with success measures. So here is CSLB's current mission statement at the top, and then it drills down to bullet points. I'll give you a moment to uh, just review it. All right, so how does that mission statement sound? Does that sound good? Does anyone want to make a, an edit? Or do we feel like, yes, that is a good mission statement for CSLB? I'm seeing nodding heads. And um, I should explain the green and red cards, index cards by where you're sitting. Um, the green card means you're ready to go on. And the red card means, no, I don't want to move on yet. I want to discuss this more. So um, feel free if you want to move things along to hold up a green card. Diana? Can, can you indicate the difference between what our mission statement was and what Kansas City has now? Or is it has a statement staying the same? Um, this is your current mission statement? At, at our last strategic plan, I think that we did update. Yes, it is your current one. Okay. Yep. And I'm, I saw some nodding heads as we wanted to keep it. And OK, I, wonderful. All right, so we'll move on to values. And the yellow values were added by the executive um, team when we did the intake at the beginning of the strategic planning process. So I'll give you a chance to go through the values. How did those sound? Did people are people good with the values? Does anyone have an edit to suggest, or are you happy with them as they are? Well, when was the last time this was updated? Was that like this whole time? Uh, it was the last time you did strategic planning, so 2021. So three years ago. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I have a question. Yes. This code the word diversity, equity, inclusion. Is it like the embracing that, or like just buying into that, or is this these are the words? Yeah, so um, they were added uh, a lot of, because of um, the governor's executive order to include DEI and policy decisions, um, a lot of the programs have been adding that to their values. Um, so the previous values that, that are above it, the board came up with more verbiage to support them. So if people would like to add some verbiage to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, that's something we can do today. Because uh, right now, like you said, they are just the words. So if, if anyone has any suggestions <coughs> to uh, flesh them out a little to like match the values above, please feel free. And if you prefer to discuss amongst your tables first, we can do that. That's all I have. Yeah. Yes. So where it says focusing on prevention, I think there's a word missing. Okay. Focusing on prevention of what? Um, you know, just you know, being responsive and treating, mm -hmm. and boom, focusing on 
dispute prevention or you know if there's something a, a word okay that you're missing out of that okay So would that be maybe violations? Um, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I had some word missing. But yes. Okay. okay. I think we had like preventing unlicensed contracting and providing. I think that's what we had. Over okay. Right. Prevention of unlicensed contracting. Yes. Okay. Good. And I have an idea for the. Okay. Um, we're beginning embracing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Please. I'd like. I'd be more comfortable with the order changing. So embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of these flows. In other words, put that at the top. Okay. So we can move that up to the top. All right. Any other suggestions? <clears throat> yes, please. For diversity, equity, inclusion, would we want to say somehow or other, and like we've got specific for the other, we've got consumers uh -huh. and contractors and staff, would we want to get a little more specific there? Providing for consumers and providing for our contractors and licensees and providing for staff. I don't know. You guys fix it up. My hand, my spelling and <laughs> idea is horrible, but I just feel like I need to say more about why we, what, okay. why we care about it okay. and how it's going to impact people. Okay. You know, so I don't have the words right now. Okay. But I understand that they will. Okay. And yes. I'll just put okay. in embracing and providing. Okay. Embracing and providing. All right. You want to um, just let that be for now and let that simmer? And what we're creating today is a draft, so you will see this again before approving it. Yes, you can. Does anyone have anything else to add, or shall we move on? Yes, I usually can. have an example one here. Yes. <laughs> All right, excellent. So um, the environmental scan, and again, when I say environment, um, I'm talking about the CSLB workplace, what works, what's working in it, or what stakeholders believe are working in it what could possibly be improved. Um, a survey went out to your stakeholders, and of course, uh, you might recall being interviewed. Uh, they all answered the same questions that you did, and you had a phenomenal response, um, over 2,000. The last time you did this, back in 2021, you had about 444 total responses. So, huge, so that's great to see your stakeholders so engaged. Um, and now we have your vision statement, which is a picture of what would happen if you achieve your mission statement. Uh, so it's a picture of um, the perfect world. So I'll give you a chance to read that, and you can let me know if you'd like to make any changes. All right, how do people feel about that? Does that look good? Does anyone want to make any changes? Yes, Diana. If we, since we added the home improvement to the mission, uh -huh. we added to the vision. Okay, um, where would you like us to add it? Um, oh. Okay, so um, after, after maybe, after the industry, um, Side of the construction and home improvement okay, so oversight of the construction and home improvement industry. As necessary, necessary. <laughs> 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 what 
What do people think? Do we, can we just get rid of that part as yeah, necessary? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, in a way, uh, it, the word model is sort of a self, uh, you know, what you've described yourself uh -huh. as in uh, model as opposed to what. And I just ditched the word model because there are that's a subjective value we've okay. now assigned our vision and we haven't provided any information as to why we consider ourselves a model agency. Okay. I don't know. So the um, point that's being looked at now is whether or not model is needed. I will say a vision statement is supposed to be a description of something that like that's ideal and that's already been accomplished. So. Um, would people like to remove model or keep it? I think it would depend on what we want. Do we want to set an example for others to follow? Then we would keep the word. Okay. If not, we would remove it. It does seem without that word, it's just a, a second mission statement. It's just explaining what you do and why you exist. And a vision statement is supposed to be um, a description of your perfect future, like what you hope oh, to achieve, okay. your destination. Then that makes a difference. Yeah, if it's a description of perfection. Okay. So it looks like we can keep the model and then have the changes that are showing there. Yeah. Do we protect licensed contractors? That's the way that's reading. We protect consumers and license. All right, so um, would we like then to remove the and licensed contractors? Because the mandate is consumer protection. No, it's, it's important to keep them because that's a lot of what we do to protect those consumers okay. is to license and enforce contractors. It's just the way the sentence reads is bothering me. Okay. Doesn't it start as a model consumer protection agency, including these other things? Right here. The priority is still there. Or use the word and regulate license contractors or some similar word so that it is not emphasizing the protection of license contractors, even though that's part of what we do. I'd say one thing I like about moving license contractors the way it is is mm -hmm. that also contractors rely on each other. And so, for instance, many of us perform part of the project. You add a descriptive word before the word license. It's not protect. I think it does. I mean, I think to Mary's point, it does indirectly protect the licensed contractors by forcing, yeah. not by forcing, by yeah. licensing the industry. I think we also think that helps to protect the licensed contractors, so I think we should double down Okay. Indirect benefit of it. Okay. Do we have a green card then? One. Okay. I, okay, I think that's it. Great. Uh, so your goals, again, goals refer to your, the board's day-to-day uh, -day operations. We've got licensing and testing and enforcement, legislation, public affairs, and executive. And um, when we look at these areas, the aim is to develop about three to six objectives per goal area. If you do more or less than that, it's fine, but generally you want to aim for three to six. And this is a flow chart of the strategic planning process from beginning to end. Um, the arrow is where we are today, so you're halfway through it. Uh, today we'll be coming up with a draft of your strategic plan. After today, we'll be coming, um, the board will get a chance to review the draft, approve it, and once it's approved, then uh, board staff can do action planning to figure out how they're going to achieve that strategic plan. When we look at the data from uh, when we looked at the data from the survey and from your interviews, we applied what is called as a SWOT analysis. Fancy way of saying we looked at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and picked out the major trends. Uh, you will see them summarized in the PowerPoint today, and hopefully you had a chance to look at the environmental scan before today. 
um, as well. Uh, also, according, um, in accordance to supporting the DEI, we had added four questions um, about how CSLB can gain different perspectives about ideas and priorities, if there are any barriers or unnecessary requirements to licensure, outreach, um, ways to outreach and connect with all Californians, and then how to further equal opportunities. So those are also part of the analysis. Roles and responsibilities today, the strategic direction of the board rests in the hands of those participating today. Um, please remember consumer protection is the mandate. And then also please remember that staff will be responsible for carrying out the strategic plan. Sometimes board members get so excited and carried away, they, they come up with a ton of objectives and then um, it's the poor staff that has to carry that out. So just remember that staff have limited time and resources. So your tools to get through this process today are your expertise, your objectives workbook, the 2024 environmental scan, and then your sunset review. Again, uh, you'll want to aim for three to six objectives per goal area. Um, you'll be identifying issues and topics based on the feedback from the environmental scan, the why to address it, how can the board solve it, and then finally the desired outcome. Um, we'll have you discuss at your tables for a little bit and then get back as a group. And then our model is the SMARTY model. You might have heard of SMART goals, uh, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, time-based. With diversity, equity, and inclusion, we've added inclusive and equitable into the model. And then how this would look, this is just a generic example, so it's not specific to CSLB. But uh, in this example, the issue or topic is untrained staff, lack of clear policies and procedures. Why address it? Because there's inconsistent interpretation and application of the laws. Uh, how can it be addressed? Well, map current processes, write clear policies and procedures, train staff. And then the desired outcome is uh, policies clarified, staff trained, um, consistency in interpretation and application of the laws. So that's how it's broken out. All right, so the first area is uh, licensing and testing. And first of all, does that uh, goal area title, does that still look good? Is it still licensing and testing? Okay, and then uh, the definition underneath us uh, provided by the board last time, does that definition still look adequate? I'm seeing a nodding head. All right, so we're gonna give you about uh, five minutes to just discuss at your table, and then we'll get back as a group. And then if anyone needs more time, we can obviously give you more time. And we did summarize, um, here's a summary of um, the licensing and testing weaknesses, and then possible external opportunities and threats.
and then the desired outcome? More licensed contracts. More licensed contracts. <laughs> Okay. All right. What do people think? Does that look good? I, I would say everyone has this strategic plan from last year. Right? This kind of goal was something that we tried to address the same goal three years ago. And the 1.1, 1 .1, and it, it's still ongoing because it's obviously a need that we're still trying to continue to address. I think that initial goal that we had at one point was a great goal that we can kind of tweak to fit this narrative here. Um, a lot of to do with public affairs, too, of, of being able to effectively say, hey, these are, we did uh, a lot of translation videos, we did a lot of license to build videos. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we collectively as an organization, it, it's not just a licensing issue, it's an entire organization issue. How do we get everyone on the board and same? But, um, yeah, it's. I think we can almost tweak that first goal to keep it ongoing to, to add it uh, very fun here. And it is good to uh, reference your old strategic plan. I would just caution against carrying forward too many objectives from it because when it, you go to Sunset Review, there might be a question that's like, well, hey, that was on your last plan. Why didn't you achieve it? And, you know, so. It's, it's good if there are some um, objectives from your last plan that are ongoing and you want to continue, but we also want to make sure we look at the current data, which is your current environmental scan, and those are the issues that your stakeholders believe are the most important now, like in, in um, like 2024. Yeah, 2024. All right. Any other issues that people would like to address in the area of licensing and testing? Yes. So you know, we, we often talk about barriers to licensing. Mm -hmm. and we're also facing um, issues regarding $500 limits to, uh, to, to work. So thinking of a, a way to create a pathway for a, a provisional license that, that allows contractors to uh, verify that the work they're doing meets minimum standards, meets my example on economy gets it towards a full license that only allows to maybe three to five to four thousand dollar project. Okay. So so that and, and obviously they would have to have workers help as well. So creating a pathway to to let them gain that practical experience okay. uh, that they can't verify at the moment. Um, but but be able to quantify it on a provisional basis okay. for several years such time that they actually meet the minimum requirements to get a, a full-blown license. Okay. Uh, so, so when you put, you know, guardrails, uh, something, something simple as a, an evaluation from the homeowner that says they're, they're only charging 10 percent, uh, they came into the job in a timely fashion, the quality was as they said it was going to be, mm -hmm. the permit was filled out and it was completed on time. So simple things like that, cross-checking, uh, that a level of scrutiny that allows them to quantify that they are on the path that is giving a good uh, to have that removal of, of provisional license to a full blown license. Okay. And then the desired outcome? Well, well for them to, to have such a, a means to bring people out of the underground economy and, and not to work. Okay. So, so that they can actually become quantifiable and, and into the, the two contracts as well. Okay. Is, is, is what you said, Miguel, make sure I'm hearing correctly, but, you know, currently it will be about $500 and we have the contract left. So the same raising under $500 being able to figure out a way to prove that experience for any work that's done. Well, they would take, they'd have to, you know, do some type of license, you know, they, they've got maybe the schooling, maybe they have, you know, they don't meet quite meet the criteria to be, mm -hmm. you know, to meet the educational or trade portion of the two license. They're not there. And, and they may have to spend another two years of gaining that experience, doing the work, somehow quantifying the work. So, 
trying to remove that barrier so that we can get them into the kind of, of being a boss by contract with those who remind us in place at the same time. Doesn't the uh, B2 license have less of a experience requirement, educational requirement? Is that kind of like that? Still the same? So, you know, I think here, or I just expound on. I think what he's, um, you know, just listening. It's like the DMV, right? You have, you have to take a driver's license to get a license, but when you're 16, you can get a permit, right? And you have to show experience, and you know, and by a certain age, now you can get a driver's license, and because you have shown you're a responsible person that can, you know, meet the criteria. That's kind of what I'm getting here. I think it's a kind of like I'm not sure that's kind of where he's going with this. regarding he has a bill that would raise the minor worker exemption to five thousand dollars i believe we're going to discuss tomorrow is he's amended that bill uh, to have a registration so his thought is you could have a registration it would be a pathway to obtaining the b2 license uh, it would also be a way to document what somebody's doing and require a license bond uh, to protect the consumer and maybe preclude hiring any workers so you don't get into that area so I, I just throw that out. I think that's kind of where I think Miguel was talking about having a bridge to being unlicensed to being able to someday have a full contractor's license. So does it look like we captured what you were saying, or would you like us to make any additions or edits? How would this be under uh, licensing and testing? Obviously. Current laws are, are in place. Anything that we would, would want to try to accomplish and change would be a pathway. Any kind of things outside of regulatory correctly or wrong would need legislation. Would this be in legislation or would this be in licensing? We can move it. So, legislation is one of the goal areas. So, if you'd like, if you feel it fits under legislation better, we can put it, move it under there. I, I, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Currently, like the apparel department, mm -hmm. she would be no way she would be able to run with this goal because there's no uh -huh. legislation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and another way to handle it if, is if you keep it in this area, then when it comes time to action planning, that's where we break it down the staff into the tasks necessary to achieve it, and that could be one of the tasks. So um, either way, it could fit here, or if you feel more comfortable moving it to legislation, that's fine. Diana? Could, could we move it to legislation, but for this right here, can we put the word future in front of pathway? Okay, so future pathway to provisional license? For here, okay. and move this whole thing without the word future to licensing, because that's where it Okay. So we, we kept it in licensing, but here we, we also put it in legislation only without the word future. So, all right. Any other issues that you found that you'd like to address in the area of licensing and testing? Yes, please. Oh. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak or not. Is everybody else's board member talking? Like, am I allowed to speak? Well, anybody's allowed to speak. Anybody? Okay. But this is also the board member. Okay. Through the renewal process, like an open book exam on permits okay. and building codes mm -hmm. and safety and wage laws, that kind of thing, such that they have to take it and pass it. We know that they've reviewed it, we know they've read it mm -hmm. before they go forward and renew their license. Okay. And then
and then um, I mean the problem with that as we discussed is I've dealt with it in other states and it's just question yeah. oh. right it's, it's yes if we want to talk about continuing education we got to figure out that it's a whole other topic okay to figure out how to do it because you do it in other states and it's like you can pass them a ticket and you get a speed ticket <laughs> oh okay <laughs> so sure. I don't know if I put that on there okay um, the other thing that we've had a lot of And then the wide dresses. A DMV, that's a model right now of consumers being able to be happy with DMV because of their process times have actually increased. So mm -hmm. something like that. that okay. We'll implement for the, the fifty. Yeah. Okay. We are, from what I hear, everyone's happy with DMV for those reasons of the process time. Okay. Um, did you have something to add? I wanted to go back to the continuing education. Okay. Um, there's some avenues out there for kind of like Calvo and, and IAMO and ICC that have different training and they give you credits and uh, CEUs that give those to them mm -hmm. as well. And that might be something you can use as a base to, to grab and show, hey, you have this, you have, you show me some certificates or whatever they get that they've gone through those trainings. Because we do it when we do our right. conferences, we do trainings, I know they do as well. I know Calvo does them uh, every year. They have them as well, they get those CEUs. Mm -hmm. That might be something that, you know, either you can take this class or you can these credits and then take this test, or you can provide us with enough CEUs showing that you've been to these trainings that would equal out the same amount and you wouldn't have to test per se. It might be something that would work that way as well. Because that's what we do if we have right. enough, we don't have to. If yeah. we don't have enough, then we still have to pass. Yeah. So it kind of balances out. I think my only concern would be we have, what, 46 trades, 45 trades? Every single one's going to have different continuing education requirements. And some have much better classes than others, like I have. Right. So that would be my only thing, is someone's going to have to go through and vet those, find them all, confirm them all, and keep track of them all. I, I, don't, I think I'm looking more Not crossing it off the list. Yeah, but I'm saying we're getting at it where certain Trades mm -hmm. have to have so many different CEUs for what which qualifies, what's not, and that might give you like a like plumbing, whatever it would be, this many CEUs at this location from this location that they get that would qualify <coughs> for not having to take you take that test or whatever. And it could be a higher number, but I don't know, that's you know years and how many years you want to do within and stuff right. like that. Yeah. So we look at it for like three years. You have to have so many. Mary or yep. just wanted to add in the um, extra stakeholder highlight of outdated and unrelated content on the exam. Okay. So just noting that the uh, industry is changing faster than we are. Okay. And so trying to make sure that our exams are staying current with instruction content. Okay. Okay. I feel like a lot of the um, issues we're involved in right this minute with this is because the industry is going faster than the contract. Yeah. It may also be another thing of mm -hmm. we need to advertise a little thing. better that we are updating them. Maybe people don't realize it's happening. I know, but maybe nobody else does and they don't realize we're updating them. It's really good example. 
example of that is, and I hate to say solar, but we have solar panels on roofs. They need to come off so we can re-roof all these properties. And is the roofing contractor capable of doing that? That's how the industry changes, and we've got to keep up with the innovation and the changes of the industry. I, I think it's a real opportunity to be with stakeholders, as industry groups, and we find out they're doing work today they didn't do say 10 years. What we're seeing a lot is, besides solar offshore wind, we're also seeing a lot of those robotics and technology computers, right, that are coming into the job sites and, you know, what, what you know, probably maybe in the case of carpenter, what, you know, it would take five carpenters to do, you can get a robot out there and do it within 20 minutes. Going back to your point about the continuous education, I think that's really important. But on the aspect of safety, you know, one thing that all trades are held up to is the federal, the OSHA panel, OSHA 30. That applies to everybody. And I would also say wage order 16, state law here at Cali, right? About making sure the rest periods and mid periods are just general thing that a lot of contractors are only are unaware of and cheat the cheat state laws. Right? So those are good continuous education pieces that everybody should know. Someone mentioned stakeholders. I think it's important just in the wall and ceiling industry changed so much mm -hmm. that some contractors, uh, <coughs> some material suppliers won't even sell you anything unless you go through their certification. Okay. So it would be really good to, uh, you know, collaborate with the license board to say, you know, your particular industry, mm -hmm. what's new, what's happening, mm -hmm. you have to be certified. Some of these guys are trying to buy stuff at home, but going and messing things up. Whereas, okay. Um, a lot of material suppliers, the bigger ones, mm -hmm. won't sell you anything. Okay, so is that a new issue? Um, something about certifications and collaborating? Okay, um, so the issue topic is certifications that are needed and then um, why address it? Because some people won't even sell you materials if you don't have the proper certification or up-to-date. Well, you want to address it because it's, it's the industry. If somebody mm -hmm. does something that uh, should have been certified, screws it up, it reflects on everybody else. I'm not going to use that stuff. Okay. Installation. Right. So proper installation, did I hear? Okay. And then um, you mentioned collaborating with stakeholders. Stakeholders, okay. Mm -hmm. And did someone say manufacturers? Okay. And mm -hmm. okay. And then the desired outcome is that licensees have current certifications. Certifications. Okay. All right, we got six <laughs> objectives already. So <laughs> let's make sure that we get them all finished. So um, the slow processing times benefit, of course, um, how can the board solve and address the slow <coughs> processing times for applications? Like, like so, so part of what we'll be hearing tomorrow uh, with Jason Harris is that the online application process uh, our progress on that okay. that is one of the biggest factors. Okay. And uh, and the associated processing times that will come out of that improvement. Okay. So okay. we are doing something, but we are in the process of implementing. Okay. So um, how the board can address that? Implementing the online application or business? Yeah, business modernization. Yep. And then. Um, I, I'm sure some of these questions seem redundant, but um, desired outcome, I would think, would be faster processing times or, uh, okay. And would you like us to go, so you have six now. You, um, we only suggest three to six per area. Certainly, you're welcome to do more, but again, I caution you, remember that staff have to carry out these objectives. Uh, would you like us to go back to the first one? And you'll oh, I see a green card. Would you like us to go back to the number one? Just go through them, or are you ready to move on? <laughs> move on. Move on. Okay. So throughout today, um, Sarah and I will trade places, so you don't have to listen to just one of us talk the whole time. So I'll be start typing, and, and, and Sarah will start. All right, so next we have enforcement, everyone's favorite topic. Um, 
Um, the, I'm guessing enforcement is still the correct title for this one. Um, but let's look at the goal area description and decide, do we want to make any tweaks to this goal area description? <clears throat> Looks good? Okay. All right, so we'll give you a couple, a couple minutes to look um, the environmental scan over and kind of workshop with your little groups. Um, actually, can we go back to one slide? Go back, just because they don't have the page numbers. Oh, so it's yes. under in parentheses. Oh my gosh, it is. <laughs> so um, the, it'll be on the environmental scan pages 15 through 16. So we'll give you some time. Yeah. 
All right, are we ready to work on enforcement objectives? All right, we're ready. Okay, does anyone have any um, issues that they want to discuss? See, hand here. Yeah, we brought up, uh, you know, it says it said AI is one of those things. It's like, you know, proactive enforcement. Doing stings and all that stuff, but how do we get more? How do we get on the places where these unlicensed contractors are going to find work? Okay, so, so Angie's List, uh, you know, Craigslist, Thumbtack, Facebook, there's all this advertising for unlicensed activity. Okay. How do, how do we start enforcing at that level? I think it's like I said, tied that. So how is the board going to address um, these false advertisements? What do we do to, to solve that issue? Maybe it blends into public affairs, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking of PSAs. Those okay. kinds of things. Suppose, suppose you have a little radio bird here or there or a TV spot here or there mm -hmm. that told people that what you're going to hear tomorrow in some of these cases, these people are being sprinkled. And by the way, they're Pick that up, you know, when they talk about those kinds of things. So um, they talk about it among ourselves here and tomorrow, other than one major meeting for something else. But uh, it, it would be nice to get the word out that people are being swindled. And uh, for their advantage to make sure that the contractors have licenses. And by the way, you know, call the CSOB or get online and see, hey, wait a minute, what do I need to do? So I don't needs to get out a little bit more, especially, you would probably wouldn't do it to legislation or even maybe not to licensing, but that certainly depends on the sure. But for enforcement, so people's interest. So would our um, desired outcome then be increased consumer awareness? Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we have any other issues that we want to bring up for enforcement? Well, uh, oh, sure. What about possibly pushing that one that social media out there? Sort of our take to restrict the mm -hmm. type of people that can put out their. We talked about it before, and I think Dave said the system was fine at that point. It's really hard to block the system when everybody's afraid. So, you know, I agree. Yeah, but I'm not just that and maybe have a little disclaimer, you know, you can be licensed, but something that's out there to put that on the well, site for make it for. Our enforcement department says we don't know when it's time to say, hey, these guys are sitting over there, they're not licensed. They just did not advertise. So it's a way that obviously. I know um, for Barbara Cosmo, Yelp has an option to input your license. I don't know if that's something that um, contractors can also like Definitely try to do.
CSLB today compared to staffing levels to what they were five years ago. We've only added one position. That's kind of amazing. And so we really need to we need to determine if we have sufficient resources to address unlicensed practice. It's a it's a holdover from the last it's kind of a holdover from the last strategic objective. But we need to look at our resource needs. Do we need additional positions? Does the board support additional positions to do what you're talking about? to address unlicensed print ads. In California, advertising illegally for construction is a misdemeanor. Yet if you go to Craigslist, which I've done, you'll find 40% or more are, are posted by unlicensed people. So you know, that would be a question for the board members. Is that gonna be a priority? Uh, do we wanna get additional staff to, to really take that on? So if they get a certain number of misdemeanors, can we revoke their license for them and have a license? Uh, <laughs> Well, what happens if they get, I don't know, the California penal system, but what happens if you get a misdemeanor? What happens? As far as where in the summary is saying stricter penalties are needed um, in enforcement, stricter penalties needed for unlicensed contractors as well. Yeah, we look at the board support of your strategic planning a number of years ago. <laughs> second offense, it's a mandatory 90 days. Now the judge doesn't always have to do that, but I will tell you, it is effective. You don't see, we have some that are repeat offenders, but for the most part, it's effective at either getting the person licensed or out of the industry. So is um, stricter penalty something that we do want to include in the strategic plan? Okay. Um, why do we need to address this? Uh, to deter repeat offenders? So I have the privilege of meeting with Senator Mike McGuire over this issue. You want to know if you have enough resources to have somebody in each, like each county to deal with unlicensed practice? You don't. A SWIFT unit comprises 27 people, 58 counties. We've got to have more staff just for that purpose. Also, are we equipped with, with very, very timely when we have a declared disaster area and we have bad contractors come in? So we did try to get a consultant. We put it out to bid. Consultants, I think it was because we capped it at $70,000. We're in the process right now of going back out to bid. We do have to get an exemption though, because Mike, why don't you go ahead and explain what you're doing? Well, there's a there's an expenditure freeze from the Department of Finance for the budget uh, deficit. So all expenses need to be justified as mission critical. No problem. We can justify this as mission critical. Uh, we also did some proactive steps as we're seeing that in our SLEA report. Process, so that put it out a little bit longer, but we hope to have um, approval to go to the RFP hopefully by mid summer. You know, it's just really critical that we did talk about that because we do need the board's support. You know, we're looking this would be a strategic objective so that if there's pushback about spending, I think it might be up to $200,000, yeah. we can say the board did support this. We're going to take a look at getting some additional enforcement. Absolutely critical. So 
I, I think this would probably fall under ledge, but kind of when we took a, take a look at our, our reg, the 884 mines where we have our guidelines and they're established as minimum silver penalty, a lot of these are $100. So we, we, we reduce it to $100. We don't want that the gals thing. I know, but. You, you, <laughs> we, we were just talking about it, and it was kind of where I, I said, and I don't know if this is in play, but we were looking at you know, the cost of the job of what they're actually doing. $2,000 fix in this wall, $2,000, you know, a nine times penalty, the $18,000 penalty. Then it goes in front of somebody that can appeal it. They can get reduced accordingly. You know, they pay $500 to the state to come in and appeal it to reduce it. But as part of the reduction, then they have to become, you know, get a license, get into the system, be a part of the system in order to reduce it. Then you're recovering some of your fees and, and monies that you're spending in order to prosecute that. But you're also getting them into the system as well. Putting it at $100, um, yeah. <laughs> I know people yeah. wouldn't sit there and go, here's, here's your $100. Huh. I'll leave and let me finish my job. So it's not really deterrent. So you're not really getting into the back end. Sure. So that's something legislatively to change that, where that fee is actually something that we can really think about it because it doesn't really feel right now. Maybe there's a way to. It's challenging identifying the person who's uh, placing the online tag. We have, we have to work with the, the sites and all that because we have way too many other on the sites. It's all a lot of stuff. But I think it's the CSLB has never had an online department that's success popped up in how many times when they've stuff that are really hard on them to get it online. So that's what all this is going down to. I could just like comment on that. into that desk investigation unit and then to a special investigator. So it's got some real advantages and it can do what you're talking about. So they can focus, some of them could focus on the illegal print bags. When you reach out to those, those that are placing the ad, you try to bring them in compliance and the event that you're not successful, well, they're gonna be a sting target. Right. Um, can desk, can desk, uh, desk investigation unit be something we would consider putting on the board? Yeah. One thing I mean, I guess, I so. yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get, look at, do we need additional enforcement staff? I, I think we probably do. This is an opportunity to do that based on the board approved study. I think if it involves technology behind the web study, it would be beneficial for us, but it's, you know, just coming from a state like Utah, Official letter to Council Mackinac. It's a 
obviously the action of the people of the other one that get their attention. But it would be good for us, like you said, there's a lot of people on Craigslist that are out there you know, soliciting work or promoting some contractor license or, or like construction, and we know they're unlicensed. They don't have a license from the Arabian Gulf. And I see out of that scheme that it would like make an official letter from the state of California, like California. If there's a sudden, it'll one intimidate or realize. So some of the topics that um, were kind of thrown out, um, they kind of sound like action items that may fall under uh, number two about board resources. So Trish has been capturing them in our notes. Um, if we could go back to number four, because it looks like we started to capture stuff about more enforcement staff and desk investigators. Um, the reason to address this, don't have it, we need more. There, there's so much underground, unlicensed economy is greater than its enforcement staff currently. Okay. We also have high case loads. High case loads? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if this is a, a, a different topic, but uh, Mr. Joel Bunn had the great idea of, of a possibility. Establish uh, his, his sort of partnerships with compliance groups. You know, I think that's really what needs to happen or to formalize those agreements and then, you know, have regular meetings in order to identify the violators to be efficient in doing that and to either gain compliance or remove them from the marketplace. I think this would be a new line, that's my opinion. The number four is about more staff. Number five would be a new line. Yeah. 
statute, but we have to figure out how we get to that level of evidence that we need, whether it's a building department official testifying or if it's enough to show that someone has violated what is not in our statute. So um, I think the board is there, you know. Okay. And then uh, what would our desired outcome for that one be? Increase enforcement. Well, uh, maybe decrease in. <laughs> Uh, unlicensed activity? Yeah, results. Increased compliance? Increased compliance. If, if you have all these partnerships so, you know, aligned and talking about the same project, then you know, we're all working for the same goal. With building departments, okay. So we have five objectives. Did we want to uh, put any more for enforcement? And we can go back to the first slide if you want to look those over again. Move on. <laughs> you look good. Yes, um, I was actually about to ask, do we want to take a break now? Okay. Um, 15 minutes? Yeah. What time is it? Let's be back. Uh, <laughs> Two twenty-five. Oh, um, the the restrooms upstairs are unlocked.
establish the work that can be done by our specialty contractors. Uh, it make a lot of sense to how they develop a plan. Uh, so we
important to consider is that um, staff, uh, like staff and resources um, when you're thinking about how long you might take for your strategic plan. So is three years reasonable for your staff and the resources that you currently have for 30 objectives or do you think you might need to increase it or? You, you'll want a deadline for your strategic plan. Um, so then, you know, you can use that to determine, like, start your next strategic plan. <laughs> I think another thing to consider, like, as we roll on to a new board, and you're kind of being introduced to something that's been in existence for a while, mm -hmm. and you're often re really often the level of Dave? I think the problem with council is you always have the committee determine the, the time frame. Uh, so a lot of it's, it could be a three year strategic plan. There may be some objectives that would have a completion date of one year. Exactly. And that's what the committee could figure out and then bring that back to the board. I don't know if that's the plan now, but that's just sort of what I think. Yeah. So I mean, we're asking for staff resources. So at least three years then. Yeah, yeah, we're at four. Okay. I mean, I don't think it's pretty much good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you do, let's say you decide on four years, if you get these objectives all done before that, that's great. And you can always start your strategic planning process early if, if that's what happens. So um, do you want to do four years? You could even, I mean, some programs that's do. That's just my opinion. Uh -huh. Okay. These are all fiscal years, right? So it started in July. Like we're still in our current strategic plan until July, right? So we like we won't start until three years after July. I think. Like, I think. Well, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. It doesn't make sense to care what it says. You can have three, so that it's a full term. You're able to get two strategic plans in and to do two terms. Okay. Well, we could um, say three years, and then, like I said, this is a draft. When it comes up for approval, if you guys change your mind, you can change it at that time. So, all right. So, um, congratulations. Uh, the next steps is just. We will draft the plan. We'll send that to, um, to, to your staff for you to you know, suggest edits. And then the board will be able to review, suggest edits, and improve it. And then once the plan's approved, we can talk about possibly doing action planning with your staff. Um, and when we do action planning, we look the staff look at each objective. They break it down into tasks. They assign those tasks to responsible parties and come up with success measures. Um, but that's after the plan's approved. So thank you for your time today. You guys have been great. And uh, if you have any questions, there are our names and uh, email addresses. If you have any questions or if you think of something you wish you said, you can email us. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we have completed the strategic plan session, and our last agenda item for today is recess. So I'm calling for a recess for today, to, and we'll resume our proceedings tomorrow at 9 a.m., and there is no motion needing. Let's go eat.